What's up, everybody? Joe here from WhatDoYouBelieveTV.com for another awesome lesson on your online discipleship made easy as one, two, three. Man, you just all you gotta do is watch the video, read the lesson, do accountability. Man, that's where it's at. Today's lesson is on the gifts of the Spirit. Lesson 10, man. We are almost done with this entire 201 series. It is awesome, and we are saving the best for last. So today, we're going to learn about the nine gifts of the Spirit. A little bit of church history, why they're here still today, and God never took them away. And then each one will be defined and applied to your life. And hopefully, by the end of this lesson, you'll be being used by God in the gifts of the Spirit. Why? Because you're a disciple, and God loves to use disciples in the gifts of the Spirit. Have a wonderful lesson. I'll see you at the end. Welcome, everybody, to WhatDoYouBelieveTV.com. We're getting ready to do another lesson here. This is your online discipleship made as easy as one, two, three. Number one, watch the weekly videos. Number two, do the weekly lessons. Number three, have accountability. The videos are always found for free online at YouTube. The book, Disciples That Make Disciples, is free in PDF form as well. And number three, accountability is something that you do on your own with another person of the same gender, whether it's a leader or a peer, and you share what's going on in your life. The checklist for this week is going to be read chapter 10 in its entirety. Disciples um, operate in spiritual gifts. Let's put that in there. Operate in spiritual gifts. Sorry about that. That's uh, your lesson this week. So you want to make sure that you go back and read that on your own. Answer all the questions for chapter 10. Meet with your accountability. And always uh, the Facebook page is an option if you want to do that. So let's get into the lesson today. Lesson number 10, Disciples Operate in the Gifts of the Spirit. Now, this uh, discipleship book, My Life, this course, is a spirit-filled course. I'm a spirit-filled leader. Okay, so what that means is I believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit are for today. Now, I wrote a blog on this, and it's uh, from a paper that I did in Liberty Baptist Seminary defending the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the speaking in other tongues, because I believe that's the pivotal point on which all of the uh, the gifts of the Spirit flow from and come after. So I will put that blog up on the lesson blog here for uh, today, and you can get the chance to read a defense of why I believe in the gifts of the Spirit to, uh, to, to what other people may think, okay? But we are a Spirit-filled church. We are a Spirit-filled discipleship movement here, and I am a spirit-filled pastor. So, uh, you know, if you enjoy the lessons, I pray that uh, you will at least know that I study the Word of God, present to you the best case, and I hope that you operate in the gifts of the Spirit as well, no matter what your background is. Now, if you've gone faithfully through the lessons, you know, starting in the 101, you should already be filled with the Holy Spirit, evidenced in speaking other tongues. And as we've gone through the lessons, we've talked about the anointing and different things. And I've said, we're going to get in depth into the spiritual gifts. Well, today is that lesson, okay? Now, let me go a little bit uh, briefly here into church history and how it all developed. And I'm going to put a, a book up there uh, that you'll also be able to see that talks about Pentecost until now, the church history of the Spirit-filled movement. So I'll have that up there for you. Uh, and, and once again, I cannot read through these lessons now in this last section. They're a little bit long. So you want to make sure you read. These are just, uh, read, read the whole section. These are just going to be like my notes. Well, basically, Around 300 AD, 325 AD to be exact, the Council of Nicaea happened. The bishops began to gather together in the church. And after that, uh, you know, Constantine has a, you know, a change of, well, before that, Constantine had a change of heart. Then he got uh, the, the, the Roman emperor, and then he gathers together all the churches. And over time, the Roman Catholic Church developed. That's uh, what I'm trying to share here in this, in the first paragraph. So uh, from Pentecost to the development of the Roman Catholic Church, church was pretty much uh, run by bishops, leaders, and then they would have elder uh, elders in home churches, okay? And and uh, when they began to organize more as they had freedom in the Roman government, the Roman Catholic Church began to develop, uh, you know, around 500 AD, you know, the Pope began to be seen as the head political figure. Uh, they began to really press doctrines that weren't found in the Bible, pressing the doctrine of Mary, praying for her, uh, praying 
according to her, uh, you know, purgatory began to arise later. And I'll also put up a timeline of the Roman Catholic false beliefs, because they didn't just start all at once. You know, this is an error that a lot of times Mormons, Jehovah Witnesses make. They say, oh, you know, once this happened 300, you know, AD, everything went to hell in a handbasket. There was no more church left. Well, that's not really true. The church has always been around. There's always been true believers. But this organization kind of developed over time. And as it went on, it got more and more corrupt. My point is, as it began to do that, um, the gifts of the Spirit became less and less. Just as sound doctrine became less and less, and I want all my reformers, Baptists, Presbyterians, you know, et cetera, to hear me on this. Just like you would believe that during that 500 AD period to 1500 AD, to really, you know, when the Reformation burst forth, uh, you would say, yes, doctrines of salvation were 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 clouded by, you know, the sola sola de fideo, only by faith, only by the Scripture. These were clouded by, uh, you know, faith plus works equals salvation. And only Jesus was clouded by Jesus plus a priesthood. Just like you would acknowledge that these things changed, we also believe that the spiritual nature of the church changed, that the reliance upon spiritual gifts changed uh, during this time. And also what we see is that this Roman Catholic Church began to persecute anybody that disagreed with them, okay? So as disagreements began, <laughs> excuse me, to arise, the Roman Catholic Church didn't just say, well, you have your way, we have our way. No, they began to kill them and, and torture them and, and burn their bodies and go after them. You look at the Reformation at the height of our disagreement to them was the height of them going after and killing us. You know, study the life of John Huss, uh, look into the great uh, the inquisitions. You know, these were times when the priests were torturing people for heresy, trying to expel the demons out of them. Well, during that time, uh, you know, you basically have a church a group of people. When we say church, I mean called out ones who believe the Bible, who are living for Jesus, but they're not a part of this uh, belief system, but they're they're in the the system, you know, like they're they're in the Roman Catholic Church, but they're not necessarily believing the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church, and like like I said, you see that when you get to the Reformation, but even before that, um, you know, you see people not always going along with that. Well, the time of the Great Reformation is very important to know. And that happened with Martin Luther nailing his 99 theses against the uh, Wittenberg door there um, of the church and basically protesting the Roman Catholic Church. He was a, uh, a German monk that, that, sh that said, hey, I'm, I, I can't see any of this. In the, uh, well, well, what you're doing here, this wrong stuff in the Bible, I don't see any of this, the penance and indulgences and these false beliefs. So he put his 99 disagreements on the, on the church door there, and he said, hey, I protest this. I want to work this out. And in his mind, it was always, let's just reform the great church of Rome. You know, let's make this a better church. But they wanted nothing to do with it, so they instantly tried to persecute him like they did everybody else. Uh, then he breaks away, and at this time, there was just too many people that knew the truth of the Bible, too many leaders, and they just began to break away. And that's what we call the great Protestant Reformation. Protestant because they protest the Catholic Church and Reformation uh, because they were bringing back the truth of the Bible. Now, once again, all Christians, all Protestants would believe in this because we're Protestants. So all Baptists, uh, Methodists, Presbyterians, etc. Well, where it gets a little fuzzy for them is what began to happen in the 1900s, like 500 years after the Reformation, we began to see that not only was the doctrines being reformed, like in the, the foundational uh, elements, you know, like who God is and not needing Mary and praying to the saints, but we begin to see the hunger for the spiritual gifts. And this goes way before what we're going to talk about now is Azusa Street. This goes actually into the time of like... Uh, uh, Jonathan Edwards and, and uh, uh, John Wesley having these real deep esoteric uh, spiritual experiences. You know, uh, the founder of the, you know, the Salvation Army, William Booth, uh, talking about this burning fire on the inside of them. Uh, it just goes so much more deeper as time goes on that these guys were hungry. The, the Moverians, these missionaries with Count Ziegendorf, I believe was his, uh, how you pronounce his name and you just study this out it's just you could see from the time of the reformations going to the 1900s it's just like this bubble about ready to burst of holy ghost glory 
So uh, this event that happens that we as spirit-filled believers look to as a part of church history, the Azusa Street Revival, as a valid experience, we, we believe that it's not uh, devoid of the Reformation. We believe it's built on the Reformation of the 14 and 1500s, meaning, uh, you know, the church suffers during the time of the Roman Catholic, uh, you know, church and all of that. And these true believers keep the doctrines and faith, and they kind of rebel against it, and they keep getting, you know, pushed down and squelched. Their fire's getting squelched, but eventually with Martin Luther, it comes out, and then they, they just, they spread out across the world, and that's where you see the pilgrims coming, uh, you know, for, for religious freedom, you know, uh, from Europe to America, and, and as you see America being developed, it, <clears throat> it has these great revivals, you know, the, great, the first and second great awakenings. Well, by the time you get to Azusa Street, what you have happened is as, as an African-American man named William Seymour in California starts holding church services, and they get baptized with the Holy Spirit, and they start speaking in other tongues as the book of Acts had talked about. I mean, this had always been the Bible. It's not like the Bible had changed over the years. It was always there. And that's what we're going to look into uh, today, 1 Corinthians 12. The listing of these gifts were always there. But it was there in California, in America, where those gifts re uh, emerge into the church. And so that's what we call Azusa Street, the Azusa Street Revival. I'll also put up a link for that. You guys can uh, check that out. This is just briefly a little bit of church history. And now since that time, the 1900s, there has been over, there's now over 5 million spirit-filled believers around the world. It is the largest and fastest growing religious movement in the world. Spirit-filled believers growing eight times faster than the rate of birth. The largest church in the world, Korea, with a million members is spirit-filled. Columbia with over 400,000 members. You also have the underground church in China, which is led by the spirit-filled movement. The, the Brazilian church, which is, a, which is a large church, led uh, church movement growth there, led by the spirit-filled movement. Nigeria, this is a picture of Nigeria. The largest altar calls have happened in Nigeria with Reinhard Bonnke. Uh, just in China alone, there's 1,600 people becoming spirit-filled believers every hour. This is amazing. I mean, you're living right now in the greatest outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And so for our purposes, I felt it good for you to know church history so that you can see how special God's gift are upon the earth. No matter how hard the devil has tried to extinguish the gifts, God has proven to be stronger, and the hearts of true disciples have shown to be hungry for the manifestations of God's power upon the earth. Now, let me just go to the review right here so you guys can just track with me right here, okay? So you have Jesus to around the 500s. I'll just say it like that, to because to, sometimes we look at 300s in the Council of Nicaea as the... Uh, the full Catholic Church. Like, that's when it all just popped up on the scene. No, it was from 325 to 500 A.D. in the 500s that it really started to develop what we'd call the Roman Catholic Church today, okay? So uh, from <clears throat> Jesus to the 500s, spiritual gifts are common and accepted, okay? After... 500 AD, spiritual gifts, along with sound doctrine, become uh, suppressed, let's say suppressed, under Roman Catholic Church, under the Roman Catholic Church, okay? <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> After the Reformation, Reformation of the 1500s, we'll say after the Protestant, Protestant Reformation of the 1500s, the church grows in doctrine and spirituality, and we would say the pinnacle, the peak, in 1906, in California, Azusa Street, the, well, I don't want to call it the second Pentecost, but we'll just say the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the re-establishing of the 
gifts. Okay, there we go. Does this make sense to you? Track this out. I'm going to put all this online for you. You're going to have timeline of the Roman Catholic uh, Church, the false doctrines there. You're going to learn about the Azusa Street. Uh, we're going to make sure that you get this. And I'll put up a link here to a history book about uh, Pentecost, uh, about uh, the Spirit-filled Church and the true church being around from uh, Pentecost all the way to Azusa Street, even through the Roman Catholic Church history of the Spirit-filled movement. That's uh, what it's called here. Okay, now that's our basis. Even if that uh, is not altogether true, which I believe it to be true, the bottom line is what I'm about ready to teach <clears throat> out of the Bible is true, right? So, I mean, what I'm saying is, you know, some people can look back at history and go, well, I disagree about this part and this date you put on that. Okay, but the bottom line is, if my, you know, summary of history is not true, what I'm about ready to show you in the Bible is without debate. This is the scripture. This is the uh, theanustas, the God-breathed word of God, and it will speak clearly to you about the gifts of the Holy Spirit initiated by the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So let's get into it. I'm just going to read here for a little bit to, to build that foundation, okay? Before Jesus went back to heaven, he told his disciples to wait in Jerusalem for the promise of the Father, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's Acts 1.8, okay? Why? Jesus wanted his disciples to do the same types of things that he had done, heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils, look into people's heart, expose the truth, and talk about the future with 100% accuracy. Can okay, you remember that about the anointing, the lesson we talked about in the, in the anointing? That he said, the, the works that I do, you will do, and even greater, Okay? And we'll read it here, John 14, 12 through 14. I tell you the truth, anyone who has faith in me will do the things I've been doing. He will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. So there we see that the works that Christ has been doing, we are to do. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils, right? He says, and I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. Now, a lot of times in church, we think the asking, you know, in his name is the good parking spot today at the mall. You know, it's Black Friday for us here, 2012, um, you know, November 23rd, Black Friday. And uh, people are going to be praying for good parking spots and deals. Well, the Lord will hear that, and he may do that according to his will. But that's not what he's talking about, right? He's talking about the whatever there is, whatever needs a miracle, whatever you see that you can't accomplish, well, I'm going to start accomplishing those in my, uh, through you in my name. You know, like you look at Elijah, you know, he's splitting the, the Jordan River and, and he's uh, raising the dead. Well, Elisha, he's going to go out and do that. He went out and did that same thing. But then it's like it stops after that. Well, Jesus is saying, now in my name, you're going to do this. You're going to keep doing this. It's not just, you know, one man to another man. This is upon all of my disciples. And then you look to Mark 16, and, and by the way, I'm not going to get into the variant uh, or the uh, accuracy of this passage for those of you who, who are concerned about the validity of it uh, according to the, uh, the New Testament uh, manuscripts. I, I deal with this in the blog that I write. Uh, I do believe, <coughs> excuse me, I do believe this passage to be valid. Uh, if it is Theonistos God breathed scripture, I cannot stake my life on it because the a manuscript witness is weak, but I can say it is valid to the church and what the church believed and to what was going on at that time and to what would have been said by Jesus either in the this exact words or in this is summarizing what Jesus has said. So I trust this. Uh, whether it be scripture or not, I just I, I'm saying I trust it to be true. Now, let me just explain that for some of you who don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, when you look at your NIV Bible, and let me just uh, you know give you an example of this real quick here. Mark 16 has um, you know a weak manuscript uh, uh, support for for being in the original. Um, in the original manuscripts, okay? So when we look at the Bible, we look at manuscripts, and we make sure that what we put together in the Bible has the most valid manuscripts. 
Well, you look here in the NIV, it has a note here. The earliest manuscripts of some ancient witnesses do not contain verses 9 through 20. And that's part of what I'm going to be uh, sharing here. And, uh, you know, sometimes the Reformed brothers and different things, when they attack us as spirit-filled brothers, they, they go to one of these passages that, you know, this passage here that we like, and they say, you know, this is really not even a valid passage of Scripture. We shouldn't be using this. Uh, but the reason why I still use it is because I believe it's valid, and I give the reasons in the blog, I just don't have time to do that. I'm just saying uh, why I'm using it right here is because when um, when we say, uh, you know, Abraham Lincoln was president during the Civil War, now that is not theonoustos, God breathed, as it says in 2 Timothy 3.16, all scriptures, God breathed. Abraham Lincoln, the statement, Abraham Lincoln was president during the Civil War is not God breathed scripture, but it's true, okay? So I believe, like, you know, uh, the Bible says in the book of John, Jesus said many things that, that, that were not recorded in these books. And I believe that, you know, even if this is not, uh, you know, the scripture that Jesus wanted and it wasn't preserved in scripture, I believe it is considered to be historical fact. That meaning Jesus probably did say something like this, and that the disciples summarized something like this, and the New Testament community believed in something like this, and they kept it around, and and they could have placed it into Mark when they saw that Mark was missing in, in ending, okay? So that's that's why I use it. I can't get into any more depth than that, but I will read it now. And uh, that that is, to me, my for argument's sake argument. So if everybody said, well, all this, I mean, they, if, if they said, all the scholars say this, you shouldn't receive this passage, uh, this is is just the way it is. And I would say, for argument's sake, let's say you're true. I still believe it can be factually true. But in my heart, as I've read it, as I've experienced it, and as I've even searched it out, though I don't have the manuscript evidence, it's not as strong as it is for all the other passages of the Bible, I do sense that this is what God has given us. I do sense it to be uh, theonoustos. And there are some that do as well. Uh, scholars, and I, I choose to side with them, okay? So we'll, we'll go on now. Okay, here's what he said. Go into all the world, <laughs> preach the good news to all creation. If you just were lost for those last, like, two minutes, it's okay. Just, we're going on to spiritual gifts, okay? That was a little bit of textual criticism there. Now, the blog will help you, those of you who are new at textual criticism, the blog here will just help you, okay, that I'll be putting up. How that defends all of these things I'm talking about. Go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. See, who can deny that, right? Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those that believe in my name. They will cast out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up snakes with their own hands and drink deadly poison. It will not hurt them. They'll place their hands on sick people and they will get well. After Jesus had spoken to them, he was taken up into heaven, sat down the right hand of God. Then the disciples went and preached everywhere, and the Lord worked with them and confirmed his words by the signs that accompanied. See, that's why I believe this to be true. The disciples did preach, and signs and wonders did follow. Well, what signs and wonders does Jesus say are going to happen? Drive out demons. Well, did they... You see that in the book of Acts? Absolutely. Did they speak in tongues? Yep, you see that in the book of Acts as well. Did they pick up snakes with their hands? Well, we see a snake uh, latch on to um, uh, John, I mean, excuse me, Paul, and it not kill him. So he was invincible to natural disasters or attacks, yes. Uh, did they uh, drink deadly poison and not get hurt? Well, we don't see the poison, but we see the shipwreck and other things try to come into their lives and it not hurt them. And then we see later on that they did try to poison one of our disciples and it didn't work and he lived and, you know, didn't hurt them at all. And uh, let me just get that for you real quick. Did, um, who did they poison? Who was the disciple that was poisoned? I believe it was John. Yes, John was poisoned. John the Apostle was poisoned, but it did not kill him. Um, and, that, and, you know, that's in church history. We're not 100% sure if that happened, but that is what's been handed down to us. But we have evidence of that. And then lastly, uh, place their hands on sick people and they will get well. Happens in the book of Acts. Well, uh, I like to summarize it like this. They will cast out demons, speak in tongues. They will be invincible until, you know, they will not get hurt until Jesus says their work is done as missionaries or leaders. 
And then they'll place their hands on the sick and they'll get well. Do you see that in the book of Acts? Do you see people casting out demons? Do you see people speaking in tongues? Do you see people being protected from harm? And do you see sick people getting well? Absolutely. So is verse 20 true? Did the disciples go out and preach everywhere? Yes. Did the Lord work with them and confirm his word by the signs that accompanied? Absolutely yes. So I believe it to be true. We should be doing the same. Acts 1.8 but you will receive power, Jesus speaking, when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all of Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. So what do we see here out of all of these passages? Jesus wants his church to operate in the gifts of the Spirit, so the gospel message will come in power and demonstration and not just words. Jesus never wanted his church to be powerless and void of the spiritual gifts. Look at what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 4.20. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. So there was demonstration of power in these men's lives. Now, I don't have time to read all of this, but the bottom line is that I'm writing here is, if Jesus cast out demons in his day, if Paul cast out demons in his day, why do you think we don't need to cast out demons in our day? Of course we do. If Jesus needed to heal the sick in his day, Paul healed the sick in his day, why do you think we don't need to heal them in our day? Of course we do. If God revealed hidden truths and pro spoke prophetically in his day, and Paul did in his day, don't you think we need to in our day? Of course we do. This is all for us today. The gifts of the Spirit have not left. You'll never see an expiration date on any of these commands that you see Jesus giving. All the ones that I've read, you read them in their context as we get uh, more into 1 Corinthians 12. There's never an expiration date. See, there's a group of people, John MacArthur and the like, who are cessationalists. Cessationalists, okay? And what they believe is they believe the gifts of the Spirit have gone away. That when the last apostle John died, they went away. Or when the Bible was completed, it went away. You can read about this. But this is not true. The, even some of the quotes they have here are not true. Even Augustine's quote is, is taken out of context here. You know, uh, it, it says that... You know, he didn't see miracles in his day, but Augustine did see miracles in his day. And you need to go back and look at those church fathers. It It is not that the gifts of the Spirit will take it away. It was the gifts of the Spirit stopped being believed in, stopped being operated in. And that's why I speak if, you know, if I'm talking to a Christian and they say, I'm a Christian, but I don't believe in the gifts. I always ask them, do you believe in the Reformation? Do you believe in the Reformation? Do you believe that it was good we reformed from the Catholic Church? And they say yes. And I go, well, well, what happened to our doctrine of salvation by faith alone and Christ alone, by his grace alone? Well, you know, it got corrupted by the Catholic Church. What happened about living by Scripture alone? And uh, what happened to that? Well, it got corrupted by the Catholic Church and all of their man-made rules. Well, what do you think happened with the gifts of the Spirit? You stop believing in the foundational truths of the Bible. Don't you think that the gifts are going to be affected as well? And so that's why I challenge every Bible-believing Christian, go back over these passages, lay aside your, your pet doctrines or your framework of, of, of what you've seen outside of the Bible, and just go to the Bible and tell me, do you see an expiration date? Do you see, like, after this sentence, you'll go out and preach, you'll go out and tell them the kingdom of heaven is... You know, the passage in 1 Corinthians 13, uh, one of the most famous passages here, to say that you right here, when the perfect comes, let me show you here, uh, in tongues, they will be still... Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. Okay? For we prophesy, for in part we prophesy, we know in part, we prophesy in part. Uh, but when the perfect comes, the imperfect will disappear. And then people want to say, well, the perfect there means the word of God. So when the word of God comes, the imperfect will disappear. Do you understand that he puts knowledge in the same category as spiritual gifts? And most, most theologians understand the perfection here, that like here, um, uh, right here, this is uh, uh, Guthrie's uh, commentary on, uh, uh, you know, excuse me, this is Frank Gabian, the Expositor's Bible Commentary. He'll even tell you that most theologians believe, uh, as a matter of fact, I can't think of any, that believe the perfection there is speaking about the Word of God. The perfection there is when Christ comes and brings the perfect state upon the earth. And, and that's is simply what it's talking about. It says, 
Uh, it seems more normal to understand teleon in verse 10 to mean the perfection is to come about at the second coming. Or if before when the Christian dies and is taken to be with the Lord. You see, there are other problems regarding the completion of the canon view of teleon here. So people who believe that the completion of the New Testament is the perfection, uh, you see here Gabian, it's just rebuking it. It's not true. The early church didn't believe it to be true. And it's not a true according to the context. The gifts of the Spirit are still here. These things are remaining. The perfection that it's coming, the teleon there in the Greek, which is the perfection, what it's speaking of is the coming of Christ or the believer in Christ um, when he dies becoming perfect, that perfection uh, that perfected state. That, that's where you don't have to learn and study books anymore to gain knowledge. You simply gain it by really osmosis being in the presence of the Lord. And that's why you don't need tongues and prophecy because you're perfected. That teleon is with you. Okay, a little deep there. No expiration date. Do what the early disciples did. Amen. The gifts are for everyone. The bottom line is that the gifts are for you. Young, old, male, female. Oh, man, just got to get into this real quick before we read it. Acts chapter 2 at the end here of uh, Peter's speech when he's talking about uh, what's going on here. He says, we're not drunk. Uh, you know, this is the point of the Holy Spirit. This is the signs of Joel happening. He says, repent, every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for remission of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Verse 29, the promise is for you and your children and for all who are afar off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them, pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Let me ask you, is the promise of salvation still for you today? Is it still for your children, your children's children? Come on. For as many as the Lord our God, our God calls for those who are far off, yes. Well, then why wouldn't the gift of the Holy Spirit be for us today? And as a matter of fact, the promise is not referring even to the salvation. The promise, because the context here, is of the Holy Spirit. So I kind of tricked you, right? So I said, if salvation is for today, then the gift of the Holy Spirit's for today. But he's not even talking about the gift of salvation here as the promise. If you understand and you go back here to Acts 1.8, the promise is actually the gift of the Holy Spirit. They could be saved in the Old Testament, not necessarily born again, but they could be saved. However, they did not have this gift, this indwelling as they did now. And here you see Jesus saying that you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And that is what he's talking about. And if you go up here, he says, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised which you have heard me speak about for John baptized with water. In a few days, you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. That's Acts 1, 4, 5, 6, 7 through 8. Okay, you guys with me there? That's powerful. It's for everyone, all those who are far off, everybody, male, female, you know, all different nationalities. Okay, now, 1 Corinthians 12, 1 through 11 will be our text as we learn about the gifts of the Spirit. And let's start off in verse 1, 1 Corinthians 12, 1. Now about spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be ignorant. And guess what's going on today? Ignorance. Why would you want to learn to, to would you, let me ask you like this. Would you learn, would you want to learn how to play basketball from somebody who can't play basketball? Or this, would you want to learn how to fly a plane through uh, by somebody who's never flown a plane? Why is it we have people without spiritual gifts telling us people who have spiritual gifts how to use spiritual gifts? Well, there shouldn't be this, and there shouldn't be this, and the scripture says this. Well, let me ask you a question. Do you speak in tongues? No. Well, do you prophesy? No. Well, then why are you telling us who speak in tongues and prophesy how to interpret these scriptures on when to speak in tongues and prophesy? It is ignorance. You don't know what you don't know. Hello? Ignorance means you don't know what you don't know. Amen. Don't be ignorant. You know, as uh, Mr. T said, I pity the fool. I pity the fool. Amen. I pity the fool who is ignorant of spiritual gifts and yet wants to cause confusion in the body of Christ. Let Paul, the one baptized in the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues more than all of them, right? Let that man who said, I, I, I urge you to eagerly desire spiritual gifts. Let that man say, who said, don't forbid speaking in tongues. Let that man teach you about spiritual gifts. And it all will make sense. 
Because when you have spiritual gifts, you're spiritual, right? And then you understand what Paul is saying. Those who don't have spiritual gifts and they want to tell us us tongue talkers shouldn't be doing it in service and we shouldn't do it like this and that, that's all from their ignorance. Let's look at it. 1 Corinthians 12, 1 through 11. Don't be ignorant, okay? Let's not do that. Talks about you were led by pagan idols. Now you're led by the Spirit, and you can test the Spirit because the Holy Spirit will say Jesus is Lord. Demonic spirits cannot do that. Let's keep going. It says, and here's a, a, um, a defense of the Trinity. There are different kind of gifts, same Spirit, different kind of service, same Lord, referring to Jesus, different kinds of working, same God works all of them in all men, referring to the Father there, uh, Spirit, Son, and Father there. And it says it works, he, <coughs> God works all of them and all men. All of them and all men. So you have the potential for all gifts in you. We'll talk about why not every gift is manifested in your life at every time, but the gifts are always available to each one. That's why it says in verse 7 now, now to each one the manifestation, the sign, the bringing forth of the Spirit is given for the common good. To what? Each one. Each one has the opportunity for the manifestation of the Spirit to come. The, uh, the Holy Spirit can show himself through each one of you at any given time as he wills. And then now he lists off the different gifts of the Spirit. It says to one is given the message of wisdom, to another message of knowledge, by the same Spirit, another faith, by the Spirit, gifts of the healing, by the one Spirit, to another miraculous powers, another prophecy distinguishing between spirits, speaking in different types of tongues, and still another interpretation of tongues. Okay, so it says to each one of these, the spirit, uh, the gifts are given. And it says now in verse 11, all of these are the work of one and the same spirit, and he gives them to each one just as he determines. Now, really quickly, somebody may say, well, I don't have the gift of tongues, and I don't have this gift. Well, you know, you may have this gift, they're not understanding. You have every gift. You have the spirit that gives the gifts. That's why you have every potential to those gifts. The thing is, God will give them to you as he leads. Now, the next thing, speaking in tongues. How many people spoke in tongues on the day of Pentecost? Acts 2. Everybody. How many people spoke in tongues in Cornelius' house? Everybody. How many people spoke in tongues when Paul uh, baptized the, the followers of John and the, John's disciples? Everybody. So what do we learn from Lesson 6 of the 101 book? The baptism of the Holy Spirit is a experience for all believers. Now how these gifts are done in the body, in the church, are done just as he determines. That's the whole point. He's setting order in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14. And what he is simply saying here is, all of us have this spirit, and we're already baptized in this spirit, speaking in tongues, blessed by God, spiritual power, bam, is upon us. But now this spirit is going to operate these nine gifts just as he determines when we get together. Okay? Now, you want to learn more about the gifts of the spirit? Great introductory book by Lester Sumrall called Gifts and Ministries of the Holy Spirit. There's very more in-depth books than that, but this is a good one to start with. And uh, I just don't have time to get into all of this uh, in detail. But let me now just begin to summarize these. We're going to look at these nine gifts of the Spirit in three categories of three, okay? We're going to look at revelation gifts, infer inspiration gifts, and power gifts, okay? So we're going to look at these right here. We're going to look at uh, revelation gifts, power gifts, and inspiration gifts, okay? That's how they're listed. Uh, I mean, that's how, how, how a category uh, will make it easy for you. Okay, the message of wisdom, revelation gifts. Message of wisdom is a supernatural revelation of the divine purposes of God. Given, uh, God gives a person wisdom about the future and what they should do. Okay, so God will give this to you by the Spirit as He determines that it will be effective. Okay, so you just can't walk up to somebody and go, hey, do you want me to give you a supernatural revelation of, the, of God's divine purpose for you? Uh, you know, I want to be Chloe, like the 1900 psychic hotline for you right now. I'm, boop, I'm just going to come up with it. No, what you do is you preach, pray, and plug away. And while you're doing that, God can tap on your heart and speak to you and go, you know, if you're available and you're trained in this, just like, you know, the early church was, and you're, you know, you're taught in this, and you understand God can go... 
hey, you know, this person you're talking to, your coworker, let them know this purpose about their life that they don't see and understand now. Share that with them and tell them I told you. It will bring glory to me. It will validate the word of God you've been preaching to them. It will be a sign unto them, and it will be for their benefit. Share this supernatural revelation, and you could say to your coworker, you don't have to be all spooky, but you could just say, man, I was just praying for you the other day, and I just felt God share this with me about you, that, uh, that man, I just sensed that, uh, you know, your family's going through something really tough right now, and I just think like it's your son, and God wanted me to let you know that he wants to save your son, and he wants to use that as a testimony for his glory. Can I pray for your son and for you right now? And she may look at you and go, what? How did you even know my son was getting in trouble at school? How did you know me and his father, you know, me and my husband were talking yesterday about sending him away somewhere or, or bringing him to his grandma's house, you know, whatever. How did you know that? Oh, God gave me that information. And God told me what to tell you to do with him. Don't send him to grandma's. Don't bring him to private school. Bring him to youth group. Bring him to church. Bring him to a Bible study that you and I will have together. And God will do a great work in his life. Now, of course, this young man comes. He does those things. It validates that word of God, right? That purpose gets fulfilled. And as we see those things happen in our life and they work out according to what God says, uh, people will give glory to him. And uh, <clears throat> I give an example in every one of these things about my life. And then I give a biblical example. And then you hear about Ag uh, a biblical example. Here is Agabus talking about a famine that was going to come in the time of the disciples. And they needed to send uh, relief monies to a certain area. And you see that in Acts 11, 28 through 30. So that's like uh, getting real specific about a natural disaster. Hey, there's going to be a famine here. Guys, we need to save up and we need to send some money over here. God's telling me what to do. Now, uh, let me just uh, you know start off by saying that sometimes we look at this as the office of a prophet. No, this is every believer can do this. The office of a prophet has a leadership position in a church. This is just an ordinary believer can do this. Uh, so everybody can do it. But obviously when it you know goes to predicting in the church and all of that, we need to have that office of an elder or deacon with the authority of our gift. Okay, so that, you know we need to be careful to distinguish between, you know, uh, I'm going to prophesy or uh, give a message of wisdom to my pastor and have authority over him because I have this gift. No, the, the, the order of the church still remains. Uh, and then the next thing that I want to say is, is sometimes people look at this like the Old Testament standard of a prophet or something, you know. If he says something and it doesn't come to pass, he should be put to death. Now, the Bible says there's grace, first of all, in the New Testament. We don't stone people for the sins of the Old Testament, okay? So that we shouldn't be putting each other to death for anything, okay? We shouldn't be doing that for uh, scriptural reasons, let, let's say. I mean, we could do it for civil reasons to make government, but we shouldn't be enforcing uh, doctrinal things on people with, uh, you know, civil powers, okay? This is not a theocracy. That's the first thing when people say that to be, <coughs> excuse me, kind of a smart doc. They're like, well, what if what they say isn't true? Shouldn't we take them out back and stone them like a false prophet? Well, yeah, we'll do that if you want us to stone the adulterer, too. And if you want us to stone uh, the rebellious child, bring Billy out here, your son. We'll stone him. Uh, and then we'll also steal, uh, stone the thief and the robber of the tithe and the offering like they did uh, Achan. We'll stone you. Have you been given your tithes? Well, we'll stone you next. We'll be stoning a whole lot of people right now, okay? So that's number one. That's dumb. It's not theologically correct. Number two. What do we do if somebody is wrong? What if they give that message of wisdom? Well, what, and it doesn't come to pass. Well, what I tell people is repent. Uh, say I'm wrong. Yeah, guys, I you know, uh, you know, you speak this to your coworker, and she goes, "What are you talking about? Um, Billy just got great grades. Uh, not uh, knowing what you're going with here. We love Billy. Billy's doing good. And then, and then, let's say you go, well, okay, well, just pray on it and see what happens in the next couple of months. Months go by, year goes by, whatever. And because sometimes these things take time, is what I'm saying. But let's just say it's obvious it has not happened. You were wrong. What should you do? You should go, I'm sorry. Hey, you know what? Six months ago, I, I really felt I heard something from God. It didn't come to pass. I'm really trying to be obedient, man. I'm sorry. That was probably just my own thought or something that was in my heart. Would you forgive me? Amen. So what do I tell our person in the church? Just forgive uh, the person who gave you the wrong word. And uh, that's why I say in our church, you know, do it in a council of many. You know, have other leaders around and don't take somebody's advice because it's thus says the Lord. You know, weigh it by scripture. But if the worst comes to it and it's wrong, let that person repent. 
Let the church continue to teach the one giving the gift, I mean, giving the word, how to do it better, how to hear from God. I mean, do you hear from God perfectly in everything, in, in, you know, everything you do? No. So we're, what we're saying in spiritual gifts, we're giving each other the same grace that we would in any other thing we're doing for God. We're not going to kill people over this because that's not what we do in the New Testament, Okay. Uh, and, and, but, but there does need to be transparency. There does need to be a repentance if a word is wrong. Now, the next one we go to, message of knowledge. Supernatural revelation of the knowledge of God concerning his will. God will reveal his knowledge about somebody's past or present. Now, this is very specific. It will be like, hey, uh, you know, Jesus sitting with the woman at the well. It's like, wow, you got some husbands. Yeah, and you're not married to them. You got some problems, don't you? How'd you know that? You must be a prophet. See, God gave me a message of knowledge or word of knowledge, as it's said. You know, message and word there mean the same thing, by the way. Uh, and the same thing in the future. It would be like, uh, instead of giving advice, like the, the message of wisdom is like giving wisdom and advice, the knowledge is saying, God knows this, and he wants you to know it too. He wants you to know he knows, right? So you, you look to the future, and God, God lets you look to the future. Let's say we're talking to your coworker about Billy, and you go, oh, man, I was just praying, and uh, I just felt Billy's, I just felt something, man, that I just felt the Lord telling me Billy's getting kicked out of school today, and God wants me to tell you not to get discouraged, uh, just to trust him, and God's going to use this for his good. And uh, I just, just want to let you know, I just felt that in my heart. I know I know it's not good news, but I just got to share that with you. And she goes, oh, oh my goodness, I, I don't know what to do. And let's say she comes home and all of a sudden Billy's, Billy's coming out of his room and she goes, Billy, you shouldn't be home yet. And Billy goes, I got kicked out of school today, mom. I've been doing so bad, you know, you know, I messed up. And all of a sudden, what does the mom do? Give glory to God and go, oh my goodness, my coworker told me that she knew something about this, that or rather God knew something about this. Oh man, God is in the midst of my trouble. He's in the midst of this. Oh man, God is real. I want to repent. I want to live for God. I want to spank Billy and then get him living for God, right? Okay, so it's looking to the past or the future and giving specific knowledge as a sign. These are signs. Distinguishing between spirits. Now, this has to deal with casting out demons, a supernatural revelation about the origin of a spirit. This gift reveals whether something is from the spirit of God, an angel, an evil spirit, or the spirit of man. Uh, you know, when, when you are dealing with spiritual warfare, warring against the evil of this world, you need to know what the spirits are. Jesus spoke to the spirits at the time of, uh, <clears throat> the, you know, the gatherings and said, uh, you know, who are you? What are you doing there? Uh, they said, we're legion. You know, we are many. You know, it's like sometimes we look at this as, as only being like what psychics can do. And I'm not saying like, let's call up a spirit and be like, hey, Beelzebub, what are you doing today? I'm just saying that we need to have some discernment. We need to know what's going on. And now people talk about the distinguishing between spirit and they just call it discernment. Like it's a natural thing. Like I discern you have a bad attitude. And I discern you have that. That's, a, that, that's just, man, that's just you being nosy and gossipy and all other crazy stuff. We're not, and, and honestly, you can, uh, uh, by God's spirit, you can understand people's attitudes, but that's not what this is talking about. This is not talking about distinguishing between people's attitudes, okay, as what people call discernment, like in that way. No, distinguishing between spirits is involved in, you know, casting out demons, receiving angelic visions, or visitations to know which one is of God. Because, you know, uh, Joseph Smith received an angelic visitation. He didn't know it wasn't of God because he didn't uh, possess the Holy Spirit. So he was deceived by a demon coming as an angel of light. Hello. And uh, as I've cast out demons, I believe there's demons... Uh, uh, of different kinds, uh, just like, uh, you know, Ephesians says there's principalities and there's, uh, you know, demonic strongholds in high places. I believe there's rank within demons. There's order. There's demons that, that bring sickness. As he, uh, Jesus spoke to the woman, said, thou art loose, you know, from your affliction, spirit of affliction, loose from her. And she was no longer bent over and sick. The boy who cast himself <laughs> into the fire, Jesus didn't give him riddle. And Jesus cast out the demon that afflicted him. And he no longer cast him out and, uh, you know, threw himself into the fire. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so we need to be able to deal with demonic activity understanding where it's coming from, its origin, <clears throat> excuse me, and then we need to discern uh, when people 
are doing wicked and evil things and, and their spirit is corrupt. You know, Paul cast a cast blindness on a man in the book of Acts because this man's spirit was corrupt. He was pretending to be a prophet, but he was really lying to the people and he cursed the man. I mean, this is some real stuff here. Uh, you know, Peter receives a vision or excuse me, a visitation from an angel, loses him out of a jail cell. Uh, so does Paul and Silas, and they were like, okay, this is God, I need to follow you, you know, and, and this is the distinguishing between spirits, okay, biblical example, Paul uh, casting blindness on a man, okay, Acts 13, 6 through 12, knowing um, what was good and what was evil, now we go into the power gifts, okay, this is what's going to like display massive power, bam, the gift of faith, it's going to be believing God for supernatural things by faith. And uh, the way we look at it here is, you know, thousands of people getting saved, speaking on the day of Pentecost, like Peter had that boldness. So it's like faith to do awesome things for God. Uh, the gifts of healing, if you notice, it's plural gifts there, gifts, plural healing, mental healing, spiritual healing, physical healing, obviously, right? And we see that all throughout the book of uh, book of Acts. Read it. And then miraculous powers, just God doing something just phenomenal. This could either be revival. This could be, you know, parting like a Red Sea. We've heard this before, even in our missionaries, them being spared. Uh, miraculous power where it's like uh, the entire village sees the glory of God over it. We've heard this from our missionaries where it's like a cloud of glory in the Old Testament or a fire comes over the village. Just miraculous power. It's like, boom. A snake bite not hurting Paul, Acts 28, this is an example. Okay, and then now we get into the inspiration gifts. Prophecy, as you read here, prophecy is brings edification, exhortation, and comfort. Um, message of wisdom and message of knowledge can come through prophecy, but in prophecy's ultimate goal is going to be to encourage. That's the bottom line here, okay? Um, and we don't want to misuse that gift. A lot of times that gets misused. You're going to become a millionaire. Everything's going to be good. We kind of see these lying prophets. Got to be careful with that. And by the way, all of this needs to be in the context of your local church with the proper authority. And that's what's going on there in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14 is he's correcting a lot of things that are being done out of order. And he starts instructing them how to do it in order. And then you see here the message in tongues. Now, once again, this is not just speaking in tongues. Because remember, Paul says, I speak in tongues of angels or of men. But, you know, if I don't have love it doesn't profit me he's not saying that uh, I can't speak in tongues whenever I want and do these things whenever I want what he's saying is that that if we don't do things out of love if it's not for the edification of the body it does no good so the message of tongues in the body when I start speaking to you if I'm say like right now I'm talking English but if I start talking to you in tongues the gift that God has given me it means nothing to you unless it's interpreted so that's why he says it always must come with the interpretation. And it can't be a natural known language because then anybody can interpret it and there would be no need for the spiritual gift of interpretation. Thus, it has to be an unknown language, hence the need for a spiritual gift of interpretation. Because sometimes people say Paul spoke in tongues, it just meant he spoke different languages, like he spoke Greek and people there could interpret. Well, if that was true, why would they need spiritual interpreters? Why wouldn't somebody who just knows Greek do it? And then you could learn it. And then we could stop having the spiritual gift altogether. But obviously these are these are tongues, whether of heavenly languages or, or of earthly languages, that people don't know. Now we see in the book of Acts that it was done and people did know. And we see both of this throughout church history. Uh, from the book of Acts even to my time, I have spoken in tongues and Indian people around me have understood and others have not. Sometimes nobody understands. But the bottom line is the interpreter can use it for God's glory to interpret to all people. But that doesn't mean I can't talk in tongues whenever I want or to me and my to, to God and myself, as the Bible says. It just means when I'm doing it as a message in the body. It needs to be interpreted. And then I give some outlines here of the order of what's going on. And once again, the blog goes way more in depth into this about defending it, okay? But here's the bottom line. We believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. God wants you to be using the gifts of the Holy Spirit. The lesson of anointed speaks about you having the anointing of Jesus by the Holy Spirit to do these things. Let him use you. Here's the prayer that you can pray. Something like this, Holy Spirit, I welcome you to my life today in the name of Jesus. I ask that you give me your gifts, use my life for the glory of God, give me your gifts at the proper time, so the name of Jesus would be known in the world today. I am your willing vessel in Jesus' name, I pray. 
Amen. And then you see it also here in 1 Corinthians 14, very simply said by Paul in verse 1, follow the way of love, eagerly desire spiritual gifts, especially the gifts uh, the gift of prophecy, eagerly desire spiritual gifts. My friends, let's go through uh, the review here. We learned about church history, and we know that that's uh, where we come from. Uh, and we believe that this is true, that there was a time from Jesus to the 500s of the outpouring of God's Spirit and the church was growing. But after that time, along with uh, the doctrine, spiritual gifts began to be oppressed and suppressed by the Roman Catholic Church. The Protestant Reformation of the 1500s began to bring forth the true doctrines. And as that happened, spirituality and the gifts began to flow. And then uh, the bursting forth of that in the Azusa Street revival, revival in California in 1906. And now we see it being verified by the numbers, the growth. We see God moving according to this way. If it wasn't for the Spirit-filled church, uh, in many places the church would be declining and dying. But yet it's bearing fruit everywhere it goes. And then now to continue on, we know the, the gifts are for everyone at all times. No uh, restrictions are given to men or women or expiration dates, right? We don't see, oh, well, only the elders are going to be able to do this, only the certain prophets. If you remember the time of uh, uh, Moses, the, the Spirit of God comes upon these helpers. They start prophesying all over uh, all over the, uh, the wilderness there where they were camped out. And then there's some people over here that get it, but they weren't in the meeting. And, and they come to Moses and they say, these guys are prophesying, but they weren't some of the people that were around the tent. And then Mo and they say, should we forbid them? And then Moses says, no, don't forbid them. Oh, to God that everyone was a prophet. Oh, to God that we all would do this. And now that is the fulfillment of what Moses talked about. Let that blow your mind for a little bit, those of you who like to think deep. Go back to that story about Moses. And he said, oh, don't forbid them. Oh, the God that everyone was a prophet. So the gifts are for everyone at all times. No restrictions, restrictions or expiration dates, okay? And then we see there are nine gifts of the Holy Spirit. That's what we see. And they are three uh, revelation gifts, revelation gifts, giving the revelation of God, three power gifts, showing the power of God, and then we see there are three inspiration gifts, inspiring and encouraging the people. And so what do I suggest? Uh, number one, just like Acts 2.38 says, let's say this, repent, be filled uh, with the Spirit, uh, with the evidence of speaking in other tongues, tongues, and then in the then under, let's say, under the leadership, and then under the leadership of the church be used in the nine gifts. Okay, so that's kind of like the review there. And, and, and the closing point there, according to Acts 2.38, all of you repent, be baptized, be filled with the Holy Ghost. This gift is for you, your children, all those who are far off, whoever will call upon the Lord. You know, here it is. Repent, be filled with the Holy Spirit, speak in other tongues like them, and then in the context of your church, under the leadership, be used in the nine gifts. So, you know, run these by them. Whenever you're being used uh, in these gifts, you know, run it by the church. Not like you need to seek permission every time. Just be like, hey, man, I prayed for somebody, and, uh, you know, I'm believing God for them to be healed. Or, you know, I gave them a word, and I'm wanting to see that thing come to pass. Or, God, Pastor, I was in church today, and I really felt this, and I want to share this. May I do that? Or, what do you feel about this? You know, bring it in the context of the church. Well, guys, I hope that you had a great time. This was a powerful message. We went through a lot. This is uh, what I believe. I want to know what you believe. And come on back to What Do You Believe TV. Dot com. God bless you. Boom shakalaka. Are you ready to be using the gifts of the Spirit? They have been freely given. 
Hopefully you have freely received. Now it's time to freely pour it out. Amen. Get into a great church that allows the gifts to flow. That would be my advice. Find leaders that keep you accountable in those gifts. Uh, we're not going to stone you if you make a mistake. No, we're going to teach you not to keep doing those same things. But we want to see you used in the power of the Holy Spirit. This is what God is doing around the world. I've added some uh, I've added some cool links to the blog. Check it out. And you can see all the different things that God is doing through the Spirit-filled church. Awesome. And so let God use you. Let God pour His gifts out through you. They're given to each one as He wills. And so I would just say, be a willing vessel. Wherever you are, let God use you in the gifts of the Spirit. Well, this is what I believe. I want to know what you believe. Check me out on Facebook. Let me know. Otherwise, tell all your friends about this. Be using the gifts of the Spirit. And we'll see you next time. God bless you. Tend to light the fire.